Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're continuing our Women in Engineering series, and we're very excited to have a guest, Molly Murphy, who is the Senior Vice President, North American Sales Electrical Sector at Eaton. So welcome, Molly. Hi there, Chris. Thanks. How are you doing today? Feel good. Feel ready for an exciting conversation. Oh, I'm looking forward to digging into it with you, Molly. And, and really, this this whole series is about inspiring women and just putting that spotlight on industry and love to share the stories. And we typically start them off just by going through the stories. So could you start us off with just about your, your journey? Sure. It's um, it's actually a, an unusual journey for this for for kind of this role because as I started, I started in a family business, and I I grew up in a family business that was in the northwestern United States, and I worked there and I was doing sales and marketing, and then my husband got a promotion and we decided to to leave the area, and we went to uh, Milwaukee where I ended up teaching at Marquette University in their capstone court. So I taught entrepreneurship and strategic planning and ran their center for family business, which was a really great opportunity. And then from there, the, you know, my husband actually works for Eaton. And so he was working there and some of the people knew me and they had this opening for organizational development and driving a sales training program. And they Someone there kind of said, hey, we think you should talk to us about this. You're really good from your university days. And so how I joined Eaton was actually not in a sales capacity, but I actually joined Eaton in an HR organizational development capacity with doing sales training and sales recruiting for our, for our beginning sales engineers. And from there, I have not left Eaton. I've been with Eaton for 22 years and done everything from leading the training organization to working in our channel organization with great companies like Eco to actually living in Shanghai, China as our VP of sales operations for Asia Pacific and working across that region, which was amazing experience. I got to be on an integration team for Eaton when we um, acquired Cooper and and then I've also run our sales and marketing for the corporation. So I've I've just done a lot of really different assignments across that have brought me to this sales leadership role in Eaton. No doubt. I mean, it's such a, a fun career it sounds like you've had. Now, you mentioned so you've been with Eaton for 22 years. So where did you go to school? Uh, so I love seeing where I went to school because I went to Gonzaga University, which is in Spokane, Washington. So I'm a Zag. And you can always tell when you're on the eastern side of the United States because they call us um, Gonzaga. They don't say Gonzaga. Right. And so what I always try to remind people is how you know it's Gonzaga is because we're called the Zags. We're not called the Zogs. We're called the Zags. So it's Gonzaga. Gotcha. And we are in basketball. So I love I love college basketball. I was getting ready to ask you, since you're a Zag, I guess that, that's got to be your sport, right? How can you not be? I think we've been to the NCAA now like 21 years, maybe 22 years in a row. I think this year, not having that tournament, it's so sad. Oh, it's kinda, yeah. It was like a miss for the spring. It, it was. I saw the, the funniest one I saw was a uh, it was a blank T-shirt. And it said, you know, in this year's NCAA championship T-shirt, you know, it was like, this is one of those memes, you know, but I guess if you're a Zag, you can appreciate that a you know, little bit. So. I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Molly, you, you've uh, done so many great things. And you, you're, you've worked with industry for so long, and we're in a challenging time right now uh, across, across the country. But what are some things that you're seeing from your seat as some challenges that industry is facing? You know, when I look out and I think about um, like what, you know, what keeps you up at night? What are you really worried about? And and probably the number one thing I worry about is talent. Because I think 
a company is only as, as good as its people. An industry is only as good as the people it attracts. And so making sure that our industry is a place where the best and brightest want to be and want to be a part of is a big focus for me. And then how do you help bring that group and, and have that talent come in and then keep them in the industry and have them, you know, kind of take the industry to the next level. And I, and I think it's really tough. You know, you compete now with companies, you know, like a Google or an Apple or these huge tech companies that are just doing a lot of really innovative things, but what they do and what our industry does for driving, you know, everyday amazing things People just don't often hear about it the same way. And so attracting that talent can be hard. So I worry about that dramatically. That's that's where I spend a lot of time. No doubt. I mean, one thing we're hearing consistently, Molly, is is the skills gap in manufacturing mm-hmm. and industry. I, I'm assuming you're, you're speaking directly to that as well, right? I am. I, 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 I am around the skills, but it's also about just – having students when they're in college and they're thinking about opportunities with, with companies to even look at our industry as a place they would want to work or individuals who say, you know, college is not for me. I want to go into a really great trade and I want to start earning money right away. I mean, the electrical industry has amazing jobs, whether it's you want to work and be an electrician and one day own your own company or work for a big electrical firm I mean, there's a wide range here that we can support lots of different, lots of different people, right? Absolutely. So, you know, one thing, Molly, we're, we have coming up, we're working on right now is is the uh, series around military to manufacturing. And there are a few mm-hmm. programs out there in the country that take, you know, ex- people coming out of the military, training up with skills to come to industry, you know, the, the technical as well as professional skills. And putting them directly in employment in, you know, uh, end users of equipment and things like that. So uh, that, really excited about that one because that addresses another piece as well, uh, but it di- directly ties to, to what you're speaking of here. Well, and that is, those are great programs too, right? I mean, the, there's a lot going on around that. Even here at Eaton, we have an employee resource group all around veterans and how do we attract more veterans? How do we keep them engaged and how do we recognize them without our, within our organization? Cause they're just an important group. That's another whole Avenue to bring in more talent in that's had amazing training and experiences. Absolutely. No doubt. Well, uh, so thank you for, for bringing that up and the fact that you recognize that and, and you're, you're focusing on that. I, I know it's going to make an impact. And one thing we're trying to do with this particular you know, podcast and this series is inspire women and trying to really give them some, some really good advice and, and guidance in their careers. And is there anything you would like to share from an advice standpoint for a, the women that may be listening out there that are thinking about coming to industry? Absolutely. And I think the the piece of advice that I'd share with them about this industry is that it is an amazing place to build a career. And the fact that it is not traditional, it's not what a lot of people think of, don't let that keep you away. Because when you really come in and you see the types of customers that we work with, when you see the types of people we engage with, there, there is great opportunity to be a part of this industry. And, and, and from the outside, when I was growing up in the industry, you know, in the early 2000s, we would talk about all the time, like people would ask me, how did you end up in this industry? You know, you were teaching. What I would say to people is, I don't really know how I ended up here, but it's an amazing place. And it's not it's not what comes on the top of the list when people are saying things that you might think about for a career, but when you come in this industry and you see how close knit it is, the the amazing people across, whether you're talking about customers, channel partners, industry groups, I mean, there's a pretty close knit group. And so some of my best friends have grown up with me through this company. And it's a great place to have more than just a career, but to also have personal relationships. And that often isn't seen. And so don't be afraid to take a look and start to meet some of the people because it'll, once people are in the industry, they very rarely leave. 
You got Which that. says a lot. Yeah, it, it does. Say, it says a ton, no doubt. And I, I don't want to backtrack too much, but I, I did oversee something, Molly, I want to ask you about because I thought about it when you just said you were in teaching, then you came to industry. So when you were when you were a Zag, and I think you were a double major, what, what, what was your path? Were you what, Where did you envision your career going? Because I'm trying to speak to the women out there that maybe they're in college and they haven't considered – right? The electrical industry, and they may be in a business type program or communications or marketing. How did, how did it work for you from that, from that standpoint? So um, it was interesting because when I got my, so you're right, I did graduate more with a business perspective. Um, You know, I have an MBA, so I'm more focused on the business side than I was on the engineering side from a degree standpoint. But I always thought I was going to be involved in running a business. That was what I I really thought I was going to stay involved in my family's business to begin with. And it was only after realizing the opportunities that we would have by leaving my family business that then when that happened, I wasn't sure how that was going to fit. And I thought maybe education because I I love teaching. I love being a part of helping people learn. But then I got this chance to come back into business and to put those two pieces together. And and, and what it did mean, though, for coming into a very technical organization, because we obviously deal with very technical products, is I've had to spend time learning products and spending time understanding applications. And so the first probably eight years when I was in this organization, I would spend a lot of time learning about our products and how they worked and what they did. And and that's something that engineers probably don't have to spend as much time on, where they were spending more time maybe thinking about, okay, how do I understand strategy and all those other pieces? That came to me more naturally, where I had to work harder on the technical piece. Right, right. So you kind of recognize that was an area of of focus and that, so you, you, you know, sounds like you poured a lot of time and effort into that to bring that skill set up, which is awesome. That's great. Actually, it never stops, right? Because you're always launching new products and, 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 and now you start thinking about all the services and all the ways how software is changing what we do. <laughs> you know, it just There's always something new to learn is what I've decided around our, our products. So I I, sp- I probably spend a good amount of time every year, but for sure every quarter trying to learn something new about what we're what we're selling. Hey, well, that's some great advice right there, you know. And and Molly, for the women that are considering making that jump and coming to industry, where where you were at that moment, you know, from coming from teaching to industry, and you had those great opportunities. What are some obstacles or hurdles you think that they can anticipate? Just to kind of give them some some foresight here. You know, when I when I came in, I did not think I would be a fit for the organization because I didn't have an engineering degree. And so I probably discounted myself. And I think what you've got to realize when you come in is it's okay to not check every box and to to come in and look for a different way to enter into something that you think would be interesting and to find something that is interesting makes a big difference. And so one of the obstacles for me was my own reticence to jump in because I didn't think I met all of the qualifications. So that's an obstacle you, you, that's not really there. You need to think about how you can do what you love to do in an, in an arena that helps you grow. So that's a very important part. And the other obstacle that comes into play is, is often with big companies. So I'll talk because I've been with a big company is thinking about mobility and moving and, and, and how you're willing to travel or, or be a part of that. And I think coming in with the, the idea that you want to have different experiences and it's okay to be uncomfortable is, is a good thing. And if you block yourself too much and say, well, I'm only going to do this and I'm only going to be here, you won't be able to get as much out of that. And so one of the obstacles we can often put up is say, well, I'm just going to do this. And what I'd encourage is don't block yourself. Be open for all the different things companies can give you as experiences. And the more you're willing to be open, the more doors open up. 
And the third one I'd give is don't be afraid to network within not just your company, but the industry at a whole. Networks make a huge difference in your success in any organization or company, I'm sure, or even industry. But in this industry in particular, knowing people and being able to talk and and learn from a lot of different people helps you know, make up for those areas you might not have had experience before. Absolutely. That's that's what I'd focus on. That's some, some great, you know, wisdom right there and definitely some obstacles that if we're aware of, we got to get over that and move past it to grow. You know, we've heard networking come up several times in in conversations and it's so important uh, just to have that network, right? It is. And you know, what's interesting, I was just reading an article because we were, I was doing something with the women in industry for the National Association of Electrical Distributors. And, and we were looking at some data. And one of the most interesting parts about networking is for women in particular, it isn't just having a network of, of men that you need to know. And there's, there are just by default in this industry, there are a lot more men than there are women. We already know that. But one of the things it talked about that's different for women is that women do need to proactively build a female network. You got to have both as a woman. It can't just be only having a male network and not have this female side because sometimes you need other women to talk to about what's going on or what you're trying to look at because we all have different challenges. But for women in particular, having both sides of that is really important as they develop their networks. And I can tell you that in my current role, I would not be where I was without both types of networks. Because in both cases, in different areas, I've had both men and women support me to bring me to where I am today. And if I had only had one, I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought this one up because we had another guest who actually, she mentioned this, Molly, as that was a personal hurdle for her was building. She found it easier to build, I guess, mentorship, relationship type, you know, within her career with men versus women. She was saying that was personally, she she recognized that sometimes that's that's a hurdle where women, it's almost like there's a stigma out there. We can't work together and we can't, we can't help each other. And she's like, that's, that's, we got to bring that down. And you spoke to that just now. So, I mean, it's very interesting that you both recognize that as, as being an important part for growth and development, right? Well, I think for whatever reason, there used to be a perception that, you know, everyone was focused on having that one woman on a leadership team. And so, you know, there's only room for one at the top. So women would become very competitive, but that really isn't the case. And it isn't about being competitive. And by the way, this is about talent. This is about growing and and becoming who you want to be and what you want to do. And, and so supporting other people and helping other people be successful, it only helps you, right? And so I, I fully agree with her that sometimes in, in the early 2000s, did I have as many women who supported me? The answer would be no, but I didn't know as many. But I can tell you there was a key woman who I wasn't with Eaton more than five years, and she was someone who was a supporter and an advocate and someone who helped me through all of my career from that point forward. And I wouldn't be where I am without her experience and her knowledge. Absolutely. You know, and Molly, we love to give opportunities here on the podcast to, to give that recognition to mentors in your career, anyone that you'd like to, to give some recognition to. Well, one of, you know, one of my favorite mentors, and I've had many, right? I don't think anyone ever gets to uh, a senior or an executive position without lots of people who've helped them along the way. But one of my favorites, who's actually from your part of the world, is a woman by the name of Nadia Morosevic. And Nadia was a trailblazer in our industry. She was running a plant and running a business, you know, back in early 2000, when you didn't see a lot of women in this industry. And she was there, right there, making it happen. And she has been a supporter from the very get-go of how do you bring more women into the industry? Really an important person for me. 
Very good. Very good. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. And one thing I wanted to ask you, Molly, you mentioned mobility, and I thought that was interesting that you brought that up as, as a potential obstacle but that we need to recognize. We need to be okay being uncomfortable. I love how you said that. Anything you could share deeper there? I know you said you worked in China. It sounds like you, you've had to be pretty flexible in your career and be willing to take chances. Anything you would like to ex- expand there? So all I can say, and it, it's, it's, it's so funny, but, um, you know, we, my husband and I were living in Seattle, we were from the West coast. So we had been moved back to the West coast and I honestly wasn't sure I'd ever leave Seattle once we got back there because I thought it's just so great to be home. And all of a sudden you're near family again. And then we get this opportunity to both go and work in Asia. And, and I really didn't want to go. I never thought my thought of myself going to live in Asia and, and again, someone who was really supportive, you know, he just called me and he said, look, it is not going to be easy, but you will regret it if you do not go. And it's not going to be, you know, he had children, he had moved in high school. I mean, these are just things that can be really difficult. And, and to this day, I would say that that experience in Asia and I was uncomfortable You know, that was so hard to be there and so far away from family and friends and pick up and do something that I wasn't sure was a good move. And to not know how you could come back into the company after doing, you know, an expatriate assignment. It was one of the best things that has molded a lot of how I think as a leader, because I learned so much from being there. And I saw things I would have never expected to see and enjoy. So I just would say to people, those things that are often hardest and most uncomfortable help you grow the most. I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that and expanding on that, Molly. Uh, and we, I really like this part of the podcast, too, where uh, in this series, we're, we're giving guests like yourself the opportunity to, to debunk some myths out there about women in industry. So is there anything that stand out to you? Uh, perceptions that you would just like, you got the platform now that you just like to knock it out the ballpark. I, so yes, because, and we've already talked about it, but I think the biggest myth that's out there is that women don't support women. And when I look at this industry, we have an event, the women in industry event for, for this industry. And just this year, we ended up of course having to do it virtual because you couldn't all be together. But we had 570 women from across the industry on this virtual platform, learning, supporting, enabling each other. And there, and that is 300 women from three years ago. So three years ago, you would have seen like 250 women at this event. Last year, there were 425 women at this event. There are a lot of women who are trying to figure out how do we help each other be better? How do we, how do we deal with integrating our work and our life? And, and we want to do that. And so I think in this industry, there is a lot of support between women. And maybe it's because we haven't always, there haven't always been a lot of us. I think they told me when they started that event, there were less than 40 women there. And now you have these huge, huge, amazing groups of women who come together to to talk about what are the challenges and the issues and opportunities for us to grow. So what do you what what's attributing to the growth of an event like that, Molly? Is there anything that's standing out that it's just because it's growing a a, a bigger audience? I'm just curious on how what do you see as is the drivers there? I I think that you know it's interesting. I've asked that question because um there aren't a lot of women, uh, there are almost no men at this event. It, it really is all women. And, you know, they talk about the importance of men as allies and how do you help them understand. Um, and yet really 98% of the audience is all women and most women really like that. And so when we ask, why is that happening or what's driving it? I think some of it is just the opportunity to see a lot of other people who look like I do or who are dealing with similar things, whether it's managing, you know, how do you deal with kids and school and all those different pieces that can come together? Is it, you know, having the dual careers and how do you manage dual careers and what have women who have been successful, what have they learned from that? 
there's something about having other women tell their stories that's been very impactful. So we, even in Eaton, you know, we started sending women and now we have so many women who want to go. We, we have to rotate because we'll send 50 women a year because they just, it's a chance to see other women and talk about things and do a lot of bonding and networking and, and feeling a lot of power. So it's really a cool thing. That is awesome. I'll tell you what, Molly, next year, Maybe we can coordinate and have a round table. We'll bring Eco SY. We'll bring the uh, the equipment. And we'll sit down and 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 let us incorporate in part. I think it'd be wonderful to to have a, just another platform just to bring the audience together, just to be another voice. It's 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 a wonderful thing, and we should be looking at that. And I already have the dates for next year's event, so. We can definitely look at that. For sure. And we'll add the link and the information uh, on that in the show notes for the listeners. They can go go right to it and check it out. And so thank you for, for sharing that information. And and Molly, I, I love to ask this question and, and I'd be curious on your take here. So uh, when you're in that moment of flow where things are really going good at work and you feel like in your career, you're, you're doing the work that you were put here to do. You know, you have that sense of purpose. What are you doing at that moment? I am building the next generation sales organization. And that's, you know, sometimes that means it's talent and I'm talking to talent. Sometimes that's strategy, but becoming that, that next generation sales team that's using digital, that's using in-person, that's, that's really helping solve problems and figure out how our customers want to interact with us with all the new tools and all the new things and having my team be ready for that challenge. That's the kind of stuff I'm working on. That's what you enjoy. I got it. Is, is, is that, uh, that's the type of projects that, you, that really get you excited about the future? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 100%. Fun stuff, isn't it? It is. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing time to be, to be in the, not just the industry, but just working. And, you know, with everything that's happened with the pandemic, having to use digital tools and be forced to do things so differently, it really gives us a chance to kind of step back and really ask ourselves different questions that we might not have had to ask right away. So it's exciting. No doubt. No doubt, Molly. I mean, do you have anything when you look back over the course of your career that really stands out as a highlight, something you can hang your hat on and say, I'm really proud that, you know, I had a hand in that? Probably the biggest thing when I look back that I was involved with, my first job I mentioned was organizational development, but that also led into leading training for really the electrical sector in North America. And I had a team of people who are working with me and we ended up coming up with this really creative idea around building, you know, almost like a university kind of format. And at that point in time, those were not a big deal yet. So it was pre kind of all the companies having their thing. And we ended up building that. And that actually became a foundation for Eaton. And to this day, we have Eaton University. And it was founded by my team. And when I look back over the 20 years that that's been there, the 18 years it's been there, the amount of people who've been educated and who've been able to learn and gain different skills, that's something I'm really proud of. Because I think that really has helped enable and supported our culture of learning across Eaton and people like to learn. I, I really believe that. So that's something I'm really proud of. Well, I would say this too, Molly, not just Eaton from, from, a, from a distributor standpoint, you know, we've had people go through Eaton university. I actually just signed up someone, a new employee. To, it's just really good information content. It, it brings up that skill level so quickly. So hats off. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, who would have thought that you'd that was something that we started like in I want to say 2000 and not even 2000, it was like 1999. Wow. Well, it's okay. it's yeah. it's such good information though. I, I mean, I literally <laughs> was in that earlier this year just looking at it with a fellow employee getting him set up to go through it and uh it's it's so good. So Molly, thank you so much. I, I really like to take some time and talk to you a little bit about you outside of work, if that's okay. 
Of course. All right. So what do you enjoy doing? Any hobbies or things you like to spend your time doing outside of eating? So my big thing right now that I'm super excited about is paddle boarding. I love being on the water. And, um, and so I don't know how many years ago I ended up being somewhere where I started paddle boarding and I, and I just love it. And so it's summer, you know, here in Pennsylvania and it's summer back at my home and I'm going on vacation soon. I'm going to be on a lake where I will paddle board every morning for probably an hour and a half out on the water. And it's so peaceful and beautiful and, um, and it makes me feel kind of healthy. So I love that. Nice. So it crosses a couple of boxes for you from the exercise health standpoint to just being out on the water and peaceful and enjoying that sunshine, right? Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Nice. Now, what about uh, for you, any podcasts, books, things that you're curious about right now that you'd like to share? You know, this, this is actually a tough one because I am, um, I'm a voracious reader. I, I love to read and I love to take in information and I have a lot of different places that I take in information from. And so I'm not, I'm not always as good on full books, but I love articles and magazines and newsletters. And and one of the big things I've been following is a couple of newsletters from Fortune magazine that they have around inclusion and diversity. So with everything going on around racial discrimination right now, I've been really trying to educate myself around that. And so there's a newsletter called Race Ahead, which I enjoy reading. You know, these are things that you know, 70% of it is good stuff. And then 30% doesn't really seem applicable, but I like looking at it. There's also one called the broadsheet, which is, um, an art is all about women's issues in, in work. And I really like that. I also tend to go to Harvard business review and LinkedIn. I have a couple of groups on LinkedIn that I follow that just provide some really interesting information, including the Gates foundation out of Seattle. They seem to have a lot of really good papers around some of the big issues in the, in the globe that we're dealing with. So those are areas I like to go and look at. Very cool. Very cool. Now you mentioned LinkedIn. So, I mean, we have a lot of listeners that are on social. We, we do a lot of promoting Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, things like that. Anything on LinkedIn that, that you would point or, or recommend to a listener, uh, maybe a, a woman engineer that's thinking about industry or is in industry that you find very helpful? I, I, so I'm probably not as good on an industry level. I would say that I follow um, Melinda Gates on LinkedIn and Melinda does a lot of work around um, women's issues, especially lower income women issues, which I find really interesting. And it's for me, a area of personal nonprofit focus. So when I think about where do I engage outside of work for, you know, nonprofit types of things I want to support. It's a lot of it is around low income um, women's issues. And so I tend to follow uh, Melinda on that topic because she does a lot around that. And then the other one that I follow on LinkedIn is actually Harvard Business Review, because I think the way they've rewritten and they're redoing a lot of their content with their research has got a broad swath of topics that are facing kind of facing the globe. And probably the third one I'd I'd actually recommend is I've actually been following Corn Ferry quite a bit right now because they they have had some really neat write-ups around all of the pandemic and the and the issues around talent. So for me, Corn Ferry's been very focused around talent. Harvard Business is around business issues and how businesses are dealing strategically with some of the topics out there. And then Melinda on kind of a more personal note of women's issues. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those. We'll, we'll, we'll try to, you know, put some of that information also in the show notes and help people get to that type of uh, content to, to help in their careers. And we also love to talk to and on eco Why about family and just, families in general, and just to get to know more, make it a little more personal. Anything about your family you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, it's, it's funny. So my husband and I, we have a niece and a nephew who we adore. And so we get to do lots of fun things with them. And um, 
I'm the oldest of three kids and I'm totally the, you know, there's always this birth order kind of comments that come out and I'm totally a typical oldest child type A personality. But my brother and sister are younger than me and we have one niece and nephew who we spend a lot of time with. And my dad is out in the Northwest. And so the good and exciting part for me is I get to see him pretty regularly. So that's a good thing. So very excited. But why, when you think about like issues and why you get focused on, why do I focus on low income women's issues? My mom actually died when she was really young, like she was 56, I think. So I was pretty young. She was pretty young. And she had a big focus on healthcare and healthcare for the poor. And as we have done things in memory of her, one of the areas we focus on is breast cancer and covering the gap for women who can't afford, once they've been diagnosed, some of the things they need to stay on treatment. And so my family and my upbringing and all of that, that's an area that drives focus for my whole family. So we as a family work together on supporting community causes that help women who can't afford their treatments or their, you know, keeping on their treatment schedule. So that's a big area for us. Well, that's a wonderful cause. This has been such a, a for me, uh, just a fun conversation. I, I feel like you've brought so much insight and wisdom for me and our listeners. Uh, what a wonderful career you've had and uh, just a, a, a wonderful influence that you are on others. We love to kind of wrap up Eco Ask Why, the podcast, with the why. And to that, we're speaking to purpose. So if you had to summarize you know, the, the purpose behind you know, what you do and, and the path that you're on, what would that be? I think I would sum it up with that why I enjoy what I do and why do I do what I do is because we get to be involved in everything that happens in a person's daily world, right? We don't realize it, but our products and and how we focus support internet, they support shopping, they support food, they support all these things that are around us. And figuring out how to help build a team that can really go out and solve all the new challenges and make this world a better place. That is what I get excited about. And I love it. I feel like, you know, I get to go see customers that build things we don't even think about that we use every day. And having and helping people find a career and a way to integrate work and life and be really happy, I find a lot of joy in that. Huge amount of joy. That that's is, why I do it. That's wonderful. That is it. I mean, Molly, you have been just an outstanding guest. I, I thank you so much for taking the time. We're so excited for this series. And, and I just know you've, you've brought so much value here. So really, thank you again. And I hope you have a, a blessed day. Thanks, Chris. And I love what you guys are doing. Let us know how we can help and support. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.